Welcome to this video and in this video I want to have a look at one of the methods we can use for calculating distance in the universe and it's using variable stars. So variable stars are those that change their output so they will appear brighter and dimmer and they typically have a very regular pattern or period in which they do that in and that is useful for calculating a distance. So firstly, variable stars sit on this part of the HR diagram. So if you're not familiar with the HR diagram, then you can check out some of the other videos that I've done. But basically, they sit to the upper right of the main sequence on this HR diagram. So the HR diagram is just a scatter plot of all stars against their surface temperature and luminosity. And main sequence stars are in this diagonal kind of in the middle. And that's where they're in hydrostatic equilibrium because they're generating energy in their core by fusing hydrogen into helium. Now, at some point, that ends, and that core then collapses. They then, depending on their size, may start fusing helium. They may have a, a shell of hydrogen. They end up basically having various different shells around the core, and they generate energy. And that is what leads them to be invariable, because you have these shells, and it's not just a central core fusing hydrogen anymore. It's a bit more complex that's happening. But when they go to the upper right, they become a giant star. So they actually kind of swell up a little bit. Well, not a little bit, they swell up quite a lot. And they actually begin to pulse some of these stars. So Cepheid variables are the ones we're interested in for this. And they may do something like this. So they actually kind of pulsate or they change their brightness. So they get bigger, smaller. As a result of that, their surface temperature changes and their brightness will change. So their apparent magnitude as we observe them will fluctuate. And it typically has a very regular pattern. So on the right, you can see here over time, as the star kind of pulsates or varies, we get this change in apparent magnitude. And it's quite a regular period for these particular stars. So it's a very useful thing. Now we can get the period very easily. So if we just measure the apparent magnitude of that star, so the apparent magnitude is how bright it appears to us from Earth, and depending on its distance, it will be brighter or dimmer. So if it's closer, it'll be quite a lot brighter. If it's further away, it will be dimmer. But we just measure the apparent magnitude, how bright it appears to us. And when we plot that against time, it's very easy then to get that period. So, for example, here, we're just going from peak to peak. We measure the time difference and we can then get the period of that variable star. And there's a particular relationship for these types of stars. So if you plotted the period against the absolute magnitude, so this is how bright the star would be from some set distance. So from the same distance all the time, that's their absolute magnitude. Then they typically show this sort of relationship here. And this is a log log plot but we have this relationship. Now we can measure the period. So before we saw the period of their apparent magnitude. So we can basically measure that. So let's say we have a, a period here. We then go up on the plot and go across. We can then get a value for its absolute magnitude. So we only need to measure the period. I know what top star it is. We go across, we've then got the absolute magnitude. And when we do that, we can then use this equation here. So the apparent magnitude is what we measure. That's how bright it appears to us. The absolute magnitude is what we've just read off that plot because we know what the period is. And when we do that, we can actually get a distance to that object in parsecs. So it's a very useful technique. Now, the downside of this technique is it's not very good for very large distances because you need to pinpoint a single star. Now, doing distant galaxies is going to be very hard because the galaxies themselves can be quite faint and they may have hundreds of billions of stars in. Picking out one star is very, very difficult. So they're not very good for large distances. They're better for distances that are kind of reasonably close. Now, exception to that is the Andromeda galaxy, so M31. We can pick out a few individual stars there because it is our closest large galaxy. It's actually coming towards us, but we can pick out some of these Cepheid variables there and measure the distance using this particular technique. Now, it's always best to use a variety of different methods to calculate the distance. And if they give us the same sort of value, we know we've got the same. We've done it right, basically. So these are very good for relatively short distances, not great for doing your large distances. 
The large distances are better with things like supernova explosions in Type 1A because they have a lot more energy involved, they're a lot brighter, and they can outshine a whole galaxy, so we can see them a lot further away. But Cepheid variables, typically reasonably close, is what we can use them for distances. So thank you for watching, and if you enjoy, you can check out some of the other videos.